Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Navigating Today's Threat Landscape, Discussing Hype versus Reality. Our featured speakers are Chris Steffen, VP of Research covering Information Security, Risk, and Compliance at Enterprise Management Associates, and Paul Nicholson, Senior Director of Product Marketing at A10 Networks. Chris brings decades of industry experience to EMA focusing on IT management, leadership, cloud security, and regulatory compliance. He holds several technical certifications, including Certified Information Systems Security Professional and Certified Information Systems Auditor, and was awarded the Microsoft Most Valuable Professional Award five times for virtualization and cloud and data center management. Paul brings 25 years of experience working with internet and security companies in the U.S. and the U.K., in his current position, Paul is responsible for global product marketing, technical marketing, and analyst relations at the security, cloud, and application services leader A10 Networks. And before I hand things over to today's featured speakers, I wanted the audience to know that Chris and Paul will be concluding the presentation today by taking your questions. Feel free to log them anytime by using the Q&A functionality. Also, today's event is being recorded, and you will receive a follow-up email from EMA with resources from today's event, so I hope you will check that email out. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our first featured speaker, Chris Steffen. Chris, take it away. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, in this webinar. Paul and I look forward to having a chance to talk to you a little bit about some of the security trends, we, he, Paul and I have actually talked about this in, in quite depth uh, in, in a lot of different settings, including most recently at a customer advisory panel for A10 and really thought that it, the content was interesting enough to really bring to focus to the rest of the world and, and talk it in kind of a webinar kind of thing. Um, to get started, um, I wanted to share some security trends We'll go through some zero trust kind of things, hybrid cloud and web workloads, best practices for DDoS protections, reflectors and bots, and kind of finish on AI and security in general. I mean, everybody's talking about AI in general, how it relates to security. In fact, I just did a, a podcast on it not that long ago. So uh, great topic to kind of conclude with. Um, again, as, as Raleigh mentioned, if you have any questions, post them in the chat. We'll be sitting here watching. I'll try to answer them as we go on, but um, you know, raise your hand, yell loudly, throw something at us, and we'll try to answer them here at the end. So uh, a few trends. Um, we'll go through a few trends and then and then kind of wrap things up and talk a little bit about zero trust. But there, there's five trends that are really kind of worth watching in data security that that are top aware, uh, top of mind for me and, and most security professionals. Uh, the first is data security. When you're talking about trends in what is most interesting in data security right now? And we'll talk about AI here in a minute. I don't want to neglect AI, but everybody's paying attention to data security and th they should be. Data security is top of mind. You have regulations like GDPR, which has been around for a while, CCPA, which has not been around for as long. Um, each of the individual 50 states here in the United States, each of the different localities in different countries across the world, all are starting to get on the data security and data privacy wagon. Um, the reason that this is interesting is that you're starting to see real spend and real effort with enterprises of every size, from the, the smallest business that you can think of to the largest enterprise, trying to get a handle on their data estate. And by their data estate, I mean the entirety of what their data means, from data governance to data location to geolocation to the compliance requirements around there to who, who has data responsibility and ownership and trying to understand those things is complicated, but it's really becoming imperative that they understand that and get it to work. Secondly, increasing regulatory and vendor due diligence controls. Um, something that you're, you're continuing to see more and more is government regulations on security. You have events like just happened with the MGM and Caesars Palace stuff going on in, in Vegas and actually throughout the country. Um, and it really puts a spotlight on how those companies are regulated. It is more than just PCI. Everybody is very familiar with PCI, but vendors have their own standards. Um, a lot of the financial services industry has their own standards. A lot of manufacturing, uh, healthcare, we all have heard of HIPAA. They all have their own standards and 
those standards are continuing to evolve and become more and more important all the time in their environments and understanding how they need to deal with them is becoming a top priority for security people. Um, and vendor due diligence also is a big deal. When, when those agencies, those top line agencies have requirements, they have to pass down a lot of those compliance requirements to the vendors that they work with. Uh, cloud security, big deal. Management tools, trying to understand how all that stuff kind of works together is very, very important. We'll get to a slide in a minute that talks about the number of security tools that are out there. Um, ransomware, again, I, I, I mentioned the MGM thing again. Obviously, ransomware is a problem. Um, there's any number of examples that you can come up with that I can show you that ransomware is top of mind for a lot of companies, again, because it's very public and you see attacks like just happen, again, at MGM, it really explaining how horrible it could possibly be. And then lastly, a, a cybersecurity skills gap. Um, the last I heard, there is anywhere between three and a half and four million unfilled security positions out there. Uh, the, the ongoing joke is that there is something like seven to eight jobs for every job out there that requires a CISSP compared to the number of CISSPs in the world. So um, needless to say, there is absolutely a, a skills gap out there. People are looking to third parties to help them address that, but they're also looking to their tools and their vendors to try to help them you know, decrease the workload that the security teams are already facing. A few trends that, that are worth mentioning, and then we'll kind of move on. But the, when we talked about data security, again, data security is way up there on the, the greatest challenges. Trying to have a unified strategy across the organization is a real challenge. And understanding how the deployment is, where the data is located, and then lastly, having a, a solution that is obviously easy to use, those are all things that are, are particularly interesting. I mentioned the tools part before. Um, on average, the average organization is using something on the average about five to six tools to manage their environment. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that means that you have to have five or six experts times two because you don't want to have a single point of failure to manage the, those number of tools. Now, obviously, you can be an expert at more than one tool, but that's still very, very important to understand the, the FTE involved trying to take and understand in your environment what that really means. Um, who takes, and I always include this slide, who provides the security management? Uh, again, this is one of those things that is constantly scary to me that uh, a lot of people believe that their cloud hosted provider, like your AWS or your Azure or your GCP is the ones that are providing your security. I promise you they are not. They don't even want you to think that. They, they spend billions of dollars to convince you that there's this thing called the shared responsibility model. And if you don't understand what that is, Feel free to ping me, feel free to ping Paul. We'll give you an hour and a half lecture on that alone about how important the shared responsibility model is. And lastly, um, you're hearing about it a lot in the news, especially lately, but the executive management understands the importance of cybersecurity. These numbers continue to trend up. And that's a great thing. The, the CISO is finally getting a seat at the business table and that seat is allowing them to do things from a security perspective that they've never been able to do before. And that's a very exciting thing in the realm of security. So uh, I wanted to pass it on to Paul. He's going to talk a little bit about why it's interesting to talk about zero trust, knowing full well that I could spend an hour talking about zero trust alone. So go ahead, Paul. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. So w when Chris and I were talking about doing this webinar, we were looking at a variety of topics, as Chris shared on the agenda. And one of the ones we wanted to kick off with was talking about zero trust. Because if you go to any trade show, you probably see lots of banners for zero trust out there. And there's a lot of hype around it. You're know, going back to the title of the webinar, right? Uh, but the thing is, uh, yeah, internally, we were talking here, uh, I was talking with someone, and they were saying, well, zero trust is just a, uh, it's just hype. It's, you know, it, it isn't really that useful. I actually disagree. Because uh, when you look at the idea of zero trust, it, it's not one dimensional. I think, I think it's multi dimensional. One, it gives a framework, right? So you can eliminate that implicit trust. You can also look at every device user flow in your network to um, put a model around it to make sure that only the right people are getting to the data, have the right privileges, etc. But I think as another dimension to just the methodology itself, 
Um, it's also a good communications tool internally because rather than just going to someone and say, hey, we have to put a new uh, password security mechanism in or maybe DDoS protection to stop certain types of network traffic touching um, more sensitive workloads or applications or infrastructure on the back end, you can frame it under the guise of zero trust and relate to a non-security professional and why it's important to do so. So, Chris, I think you were actually also thinking along those lines as well, right? I was. And I, I, if you take one thing away from the whole zero trust conversation is, is look at it as my bearded brothers with the tinfoil hats, having something that is very, very much in the news, something that everybody's talking about, and use that as an opportunity to educate people about security. It doesn't have to be anything in, in particular almost every aspect of security relates back to zero trust in one way or another. And so if you take that as an opportunity to engage um, your your executive team, but also your, your frontline workers as to why the security stuff is actually important, you've already won a battle. They're already curious about what the zero trust stuff is. Now take it and, and pique their curiosity and try to give them an understanding of why not only zero trust is important, but security in general is important. Yeah, and, and personally, one of the things I've I've uh, talked about for a couple of years is it's not just authentication and remote access because I know a lot of the um, there's a lot of um, focus around those types of technologies, which is important, obviously. But I think it's also for any type of um, security apparatus out there, you can apply zero trust to it. So even when I think about DDoS protection, removing access uh, for certain types of protocols if they don't need to come in, why would you even let them in if they do not need to go to that infrastructure? or from that particular um, uh, ingress point, right? That's right. So um, so I think it's something where, you know, sometimes it's framed within, you know, a hype, um, not cycle, but a hype, um, you know, kind of area or message. But I think it's something which you can pl apply more holistically to your organization. Yeah, and I, I agree with that completely. When you, when you start talking about zero trust, I don't think there's any question about it that it is, I, and I, I'll use the term marketing hype. I think that it is to a degree, but what we both know, you and I, is that there there is real bones behind that hype, right? There is, you know, there's the real challenges that come that Zero Trust ends up solving if you are implementing it, even in parts and pieces, your security in your organization will improve dramatically with the more parts about Zero Trust that you implement. Exactly. All right, um, so, Chris. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to talk about this a little bit. So, um, some some trends in in um, cybersecurity is, is wireless access. Uh, sorry, web application firewalls. Sorry, and I, I wanted to talk specifically about um, really the API security. I know a lot has been talked about in the last couple of years now, which is great. About you know the OAuth top ten here, it, you see on the slide is kind of just an example of how the OAuth top ten has continued to increase. Part of that's due to the fact that you have uh, a continued number of uh, of reporting. You have more visibility in these things, but it also speaks to the fact that the bad guys are, are seeing some of these events happen more too, and you are seeing more of these attacks. Uh, gone are the days where you get one or two attacks a year. It's almost a constant cycle now of people trying to figure out how to do an injection attack, and and when you have cryptographic failures and you know, identification, authentication failure. These, these are these are continued problems. And and yes, again, you're seeing increases. Part of it is due to just the visibility of it, but part of it is due to programming, lack of resources, and, and more complicated environments. And I think we have to pay attention to that. API security is also one of those things that we're paying a lot of attention to. I'm really happy about the fact that we're paying attention to API security. Um, it's one of those things that, it, it's fire and forget. In fact, I, I shared with Paul, one of the studies that we did not that long ago around API security, I, I ended up talking with a financial services firm that had an API that was still running in their environment to this day used every day that was 18 years old. Um, most of you haven't been in your jobs for 18 years, much less have a piece of technology on your desktop that's 18 years old. So to, to have APIs in your environment that are 18 years old, is, is actually very frightening. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, mainly due to they're scared to death to mess with it. It could be written in some antiquated code, but the reality is that API security is a real problem 
it's the, the next real avenue that the bad guys are looking to attack. And it's something that we need to address. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right. Just an anecdote from actually you're at the customer advisory board meeting you mentioned earlier, but we had the one the year before and we actually had a customer there who actually brought up the issue with our appliances that uh, they hadn't rebooted it for so long that they were worried that when they did reboot it because it'd been up for multiple years, many years. I think it was actually close to eight to ten years. What a great problem to have. What (laughs) a great problem to have. (laughs) It, it was an unusual one to bring up, but uh, yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I think I, mean, I think on this slide, you actually have some really good data because uh, I think one of the things we see is CVEs are excellent because they give you information and, and tell you how you can mitigate um, particular attacks which have been discovered. But I th- we'll talk more about it later, but on the DDoS side, I don't have the slide in this deck, but we do see a correlation from our threat research team of the increasing number of CVEs. We see a correlating number of increase of DDoS attacks. So um, I think, you know, there's good and bad with sharing information. You have to share information, obviously, right? Um, But, uh, you know, you can see the number of attacks is increasing uh, just in general. So I think, you know, if you look at the next slide, um, you know, when you're trying to work this out, I mean, and this kind of goes to zero trust um, as well, is, you know, when you, you, when you put web applications, for example, up there, which obviously a web application firewall would be uh, protecting those applications, um, you probably have different developers of different skill levels, right? And uh, some developers may uh, have secu- be security minded, some may not, some may be junior, some may, may be senior. So the idea of virtual patching and being able to have protections in place, which automatically deal with class of attacks, whether it's cross-site scripting or whatever it might be, um, is, I think, really important. And then I think also the way the tools have evolved today, I'm just showing this as an example from uh, one of our solutions within our next generation WAF product on our ADC, Um, you can get a lot more information. So if you're looking at a CVE, you can actually maybe relate it to the information and see if uh, it's actually something relevant to you, right? Um, you know, what would be potentially be the impact of doing some type of security mitigation based on the clientele you have and the systems they're using, et cetera. And there's a, a lot more information uh, which is available, which can help you forensically um, work out, you know, what uh, the impact could be and also what happened, you know, post-security event. Yeah, I think that the, the key there, and, and this is really a key for everybody listening to this this webinar, is that it, there are so many CVEs on any given minute, second basis out there, you know, literally hundreds, if not thousands a day, depending on the, the severity and, and so on and so forth, that you can't possibly address them all. You can't. But the great news is that only 1% of them may be applicable to your environment anyway. What the, the, the solutions that you're looking for parse that down for you to a manageable amount, then you can make intelligent decisions on how you're going to deal with things based on the severity, based on, I mean, it could be something, you know, simply, do we actually have an Apache server? Do we have a, you know, do we have a, a something to be worried about from that IP address? Is that something that we should be paying attention to over something else? You can start making intelligent decisions based on what's actually going on in the environment using some of the AI to determine some of that. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, I always just say this example, which I don't know why I always say this, but like, say you're a community college in New Mexico, and then you suddenly get 50% of your traffic coming from Russia, and you don't really, you haven't really got students from Russia, right? That would, you know, the country of origin, just to, to take one of these top points on here, uh, is a good indicator of if you should take action to maybe block stuff with geolocation, or whatever it might be, right? That's um, exactly right, yep. So, so data is your friend, I think, in, in these type of contexts. And if we, if we go to the next slide, one of the things also is like, how do you put this t- web application firewall into position in your network, right? And typically, you, you don't need the web application firewall to protect your user doing regular stuff in your network and going out the network browsing to Facebook or the you know, Salesforce or whatever it might be. Um, but you do need it to protect your external applications and that and a logical ingress point, which is typically on an application delivery controller or, you know, as known to a lot of people, a server load balancer, right? And that server load balancer has evolved over the years to have uh, additional functionality on it, which makes sense because it's at that natural ingress point 
checkpoint in the network. So obviously it can do things like um, uh, TLS offload or SSL offload, if you prefer that term, um, using latest ciphers like ECC or whatever it might be, PFS. Um, but it can also do that next generation firewall functionality, which we were just talking about on it and effectively do that virtual patching and making sure everything is okay. But also you can deploy some other functionality because a WAF is pretty well established. TLS offload is something which has been around since two decades. Obviously, the encryption protocols have evolved, um, which are uh, essential and are one of the big reasons people buy it today. But there's also some new functionality which can be brought to the average enterprise, right? So if you, um, you know, for example, have internal applications you put into the cloud, um, or you you basically are making them you know publicly available for users to access remotely. You might want to just take away whole classes of attacks. And again, it could go back to zero trust as an initiative. But the idea could be that you authenticate them against an internal database before any packet, any connection, gets to that backend application. Then even if there's a CVE against that server, sure you should take care of it. But you're gonna, no one's gonna be able to even touch that server to, you know, probe it to find out what it is or exploit something which is known. Now that works for internal applications, obviously not public applications. But there's also other things you can uh, put in there. So, for example, on most of the big popular uh, websites, you see capture information, whether it's from Google or a third party, where you know, they ask you, like, you know, show me all the bicycles in these squares, and you've got to work out is that really a bicycle or is that a shadow, <laughs> right? But yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, the uh, that type of functionality can be deployed. Uh, for example, we link into the Google uh, Capture uh, system as well as to a couple of others. So you could actually deploy that very easily in any enterprise environment. It's not just for the big boys. So, you know, when you look at deploying these technologies, there's multiple different solutions you can use to solve different security problems out there. It's not just uh, one thing. And, you know, you have this obviously natural choke point before the application. So it's a good place to enforce these types of policies. I think the important point to remember here too is that if, if you, like we were suggesting a little bit ago, if you're actually taking and using Zero Trust as a, a metric to try to get some understanding within your executive team, the idea that you can take and prevent attack that they never even have visibility into a server that might even have a vulnerability because they can't see it to begin with. Well, that that's you know always trust always or never trust never always verify right and so you're, you're never going to have to worry about that attack now again as paul mentioned should you patch that machine of course you should i mean let's just get real for a moment that's not what i'm trying to suggest but you you have another compensating control that provides you yet another degree of comfort and security that you didn't have before taking and using these kind of technologies so i think that's really important i don't want to lose sight of that either because i think when when you start talking about zero trust in general, people are always a little concerned about where to get started. This is likely something that you already have the ability to do. If not, again, this is something that you should investigate. And this solves some of your problems right out the door. Exactly. And if you go to the next slide, I mean, what I showed there is is pretty much a very simple view of the world, right? This is probably you know, more realistic. We, we've done various surveys where uh, people have said where they're using, I think it was on average, mostly over 50% were using two or more clouds, not including their on-premises environments or data centers. And I think even one, and I mean, maybe they're counting SaaS, I don't know, but you know, uh, I think it was 1%, actually maybe it was a few more, but they were, said they were using up to nine clouds, which is, you know, sounds to be like a bit of a nightmare. But uh, if you're a larger organization, that obviously could make sense too, right? It depends on who's answering the question. But uh, one thing um, we've been trying to work on is also trying to make it easier for the operator, right? Because you talked about the skill shortage earlier. And I think there's, and I know we'll talk more about this later in the webinar, but the idea of automating operations. I, I mean, a lot of people talk about deployment, which is obviously important, don't get me wrong. Um, but deploying something, if it takes like, you know, three hours versus four hours, that's not a big deal. To me, the operational environment is the one which I would care about more because that's going to go on for years, right, potentially. So, you know, when we go to these uh, cloud environments, like you say, there's definitely a shared responsibility model. And there's also not a um, dropping of your security standards because you're going into a cloud environment. So not just from the shared responsibility with the cloud vendor, but also, you know, can you um, enforce the same 
security policies like you know, say you have you put that application I was talking about uh, earlier into GCP or you put it into AWS and you want to have that authentication can you do that same policy in the cloud environment so I think it's very important to you know treat them as equals out there and uh, try and have that centralized control so you can see what's going on and distribute the same policies uh, to these different cloud environments. Yeah, one of the things that I think has to be mentioned here it very simply is, is that you can have something existing in nine, nine different clouds and, and quite bluntly glad help you if you do. But um, the reality is, is that for every environment that you have, and this is just from a 100,000 foot view, for every environment that you have, you are literally adding complexity to your overall infrastructure. And so if there is any way for you to take and minimize the additional complexity that you're having from running multiple clouds, because I, I do realize that there are plenty of scenarios where having multiple clouds makes a lot of sense. Anything that you can do to minimize that complexity is something that you should be investigating because minimizing complexity almost by definition minimizes your overhead, but it also takes in and minimizes that one thing that's a very technical term that I use all the time and for the security person, it minimizes your brain damage. And brain damage, when you have nine clouds, like Paul just suggested, I, I, I weep for you, okay? Because the brain damage must be overwhelming, especially if you don't have a methodology of minimizing that complexity. Absolutely. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, DDoS attacks. Um, again, we hear about them all the time. Uh, DDoS attacks are, you know, as, as you can see down here with this graph, they're continually to escalate. Um, 577 in uh, 2012 to, um, you know, just about 3,000 in 2022. And we're already on track from the, the little bit that I've seen to way surpass that by almost another 1,000. We're going to be close to 4,000 reported in 2023. And that's not even the ones that are not reported, right? Um, you're seeing a huge number of these attacks that are being used as distractions Why they go do other things in an environment. You're seeing IoT devices and OT devices being hacked and DDoS attacks being launched from those kind of things. And this is one of those primary tools that the hacktivists out there that are um, really out there using because it's very, very effective. And again, they're using it to attack something else to get either data exfiltration or some kind of extortion or whatever have you. But DDoS attacks continues to be on the rise. And the great news is, is that there's good solutions out there that will help, you know, defeat you, uh, help defeat the DDoS attacks. In 2023, again, so far this year, um, there has been right about $17 million so far in losses reported to the FBI due to botnets and denial of service attacks. So again, this year, we're not done talking about this. This is something that's going to continue being a problem and something that you just need to be very aware of. Yeah, and Chris, I think uh, one thing you said on that last slide totally resonates and it's actually a good segue, not that we talked about it for this slide, but the, uh, you know, you said that not all of them are reported. I, I my thesis, um, especially since 2016 when Mirai came in. Uh, what we saw in 2016, there was an awful lot of spending on DDoS protection solutions, which went out. Um, and I think this happened with every vendor. And people really shored up their defenses um, with you know, uh, mitigation, detection uh, type capabilities. So effectively, they've been absorbing these attacks. And as you probably know, uh, actually, I'm sure you know. Um, you know, most vendors or organizations don't want to publish. Um, you know, if they're being attacked or not. I mean, yeah. In fact, actually... I, I I've read a, a couple of different times, Paul, that there's that only five percent of the attacks are actually acknowledged as being attacked, much less reported, so on and so forth. When you see those numbers of of you know 500 some attacks being reported for 2023 to the FBI, if I had to guess, that's not one percent. Yeah, and I think we're totally on the same page because when I look at Microsoft and AWS, I'll applaud them for actually putting out some good threat data about DDoS because there's not that much out there. We, we do our own threat report as well, talking more about weapons and intelligence. But this is one which one of our, I was in Amsterdam a few years ago and uh, one of our customers did a presentation for us on an event and then they shared this slide. And I, I thought this was fascinating because they, they obviously um, use our solution. But what was interesting was, you know, they replaced or upgraded their 
their existing environment to do for DDoS uh, defense. And they shared what happened in the first 90 days after deployment. And you can see in here that, you know, they had like 25,000 attacks. And, and LeaseWeb is a large uh, European base, but they have data centers around the world, um, hosting provider, right? So they're quite well known. Um, but they basically deployed our appliances. And you can see some of the data they got here, which was blocking around 25,000 attacks, um, and also 97% of the attacks were mitigated through scrubbing, with the rest being black holed, by the way. So they were still dealt with, but they were just so so much more serious. Um, but you know, normally these type of report this right, these types of attacks would not be reported. You wouldn't know about it. This is a you know, not the size of Azure, obviously, right? So Azure blocks, I think it's like two thousand a day or something. I could be slightly off, but I think I'm Oh yeah. Oh I, I think it's like more than that, actually. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. And it also depends on the definition of the attack, right? Yeah. Um, but the the interesting thing is they deployed DDoS scrubbing to protect their hosting customers, you know, just as they, you know, which was a very good thing for them to do. And, you know, their net promoter score, which is a marketing measure of success, and it's like, you know, how, what would you rate us out of 10? And, you know, went up. Um, a simple measurement, but an important one. And also the reduction of their support tickets, dealing with issues around DDoS attacks or associated went down by 11%. And you don't normally get that type of data. So um, I thought it very interesting, the amount of hidden attacks, which you would never see about as an example through this particular one. Yeah, that, that last data point there is the one that every executive that is on this webinar or sees this webinar, or you should be sharing that with the executives that are not on this webinar should be paying attention. When you can take and immediately <laughs> eliminate you know, a 10% of all your support tickets that are coming into your environment, that's an amazing thing, okay? I mean, that you basically, as, as a security person, you get 10% of your life back. That's that's what you're, you're basically amounting that to. That is an awesome statistic. Thank you for sharing that. And, and less stress, right? I mean, who, who doesn't want to have less stress, right? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I can find something else to do with that extra little bit of my life. I I'll find something, I mean, there's a lot of really great Star Wars content on right now. So let's do that, right? I mean, what whatever the case might be, right? So <laughs> Exactly. Um, so one of the things also, just to talk about making life easier, one, one of the things we've tried to do, especially in the DDoS defense uh, world, is well, I'll talk more about some of the weapons and the intelligence we see out there. But one thing we know is there's such an avalanche of different types of attacks we're seeing code being reused, you know, from Mirai, which was 2016, you know, when you think about it. Uh, that's being re reused in multiple different attacks because they open source the code, right? Just like we'd open source it for good reasons, they can open source it for bad reason reasons. So we're seeing, you know, Mirai had, I think it was like nine or 10 different vectors from SIM floods to HTTP floods and DNS attacks all wrapped up in, you know, the uh, tool which was distributed. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, just an avalanche of different types of attacks, sophistication, number of weapons, et cetera. So you can't do it manually. Uh, you have to have some type of automation. And I think automation, whether it's uh, just through automating processes and tasks or is, if it's using AI um, or aspects of AI like machine learning, for categorization and information is really important. So from detection through to um, you know, the blocking, automating the levels of defense, because you don't need to put in a high level of defense and lots of extra checks if you're not under attack, if it's in a peacetime environment. When you're in a wartime environment and you've detected you're being attacked, you probably should you know, put the walls up and do additional checking of people coming in, as it were, right, to use an analogy. Um, and then also having automated reporting. So, you know, next day if something did happen and it was blocked, you've got a report in your inbox or you can go and view and see what's going on. So one of our approaches is really to try and automate um, what's going on from multiple different levels to make it easier for organizations to defend uh, their environment. And if we go to the next slide, one of the ones we just like to point out, because I know we're going to talk a little bit more about AI later, but I think on the next slide, we actually have uh, an example. So, you know, this is something we put out like two or three years ago before the AI hype really got going. But we basically use machine learning, which is obviously a you know part of artificial intelligence to look at 
uh, data coming into the networks because we had a lot of customers who uh, basically were being attacked and trying to do signatures was just too slow. And, you know, so we basically look at uh, more data points um, than would be typical in terms of the packets and looking for anomalies. So obviously we can baseline the network, but we're actually looking into packets coming in to look for anomalies and statistical anomalies. And if so, we can create a signature on the fly. Now, some people don't want to put that in automatically, but some people do. Um, I was reminded, and I, I've used the slide before, but I don't have it in this webinar, but there was a very large gaming company who basically put this in, and it was this was back in 2019, so this isn't just like you know last week or anything. They put it in there, and they were showing us how they were blocking very large attacks, and they were saying, hey, this is great. I put it in, and it just worked. So obviously, there's different levels of um, comfort with putting automated procedures in, but I really do think it's the way of the future because you can't do this manually. No, I, I agree with that completely. And and the great part, and specifically with A10, but I know just in general, is almost all of these solutions have a learning mode. And if, if absolute worst case, you can say record, but just pass through. And so you can get a sense of what it's actually catching, yeah. what it's actually doing, so on and so forth. Get a level of comfort that it's doing what you want it to do before taking and hitting the button that you know, you think proverbial destroys the universe. It, you don't have to do it that way. This is not a suicide pack and nobody wants it to be that way. Your solution can take and learn before you take and deploy, but uh, you're going to get a level of comfort right off the bat because you're going to see right off the bat that it's actually doing what you think that it's supposed to be doing. So again, understand what the capabilities are, understand that there is a learning mode, that there is a methodology that you can use to, to make certain that it is doing the right thing. But uh, once you get that level of comfort, you're going to find that the automated protection might actually do exactly what you want it to do and really save your bacon once you find out that it is doing what you think that it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right, because I think we were talking about VMware, or I mentioned it when we were talking the other week, where I was saying, like, back in the day, like, maybe 20 years ago, every, you know, people were saying, well, would you really put something on a virtual environment? Because, you know, it's, it's not stable, it could go wrong, well, look at the software. Now that doesn't make any sense, right, because yeah. the technology has matured. So I think it's a similar thing, like going back to the next generation WAF uh, piece we were talking about running on a, an application delivery controller. Um, we partnered with Fastly to deliver our solution. And one of the things which attracted us to them was 90, around 90% 90 of their customers put it in blocking mode, not just in monitor mode. Now, me, uh, from my practitioner hat, because you know, I used to install networks and things like that, I would always do monitor first just to make sure it beats what I would actually think it was going to do. Absolutely. Um, but it, but I do think these technologies are maturing. Uh, that you know they're better than the one say five, ten years ago. And I uh, and I look at this technology we put in a few years ago for um, uh, detecting uh, DDoS or abnormal packets, which then create signatures to block DDoS attacks. Um, you know at a zero day level. And you know th th this is different technology which is going to be able to keep people operational when you know before it would have been not been the case. Yeah, again, I, I, I would close with saying that this is not a suicide pact. Get the level of comfort that you feel you need to with the technology, because again, everybody's got their own maturity level. I understand that it can be scary sometimes. You don't want to shut down the world all at once. I get all of that. But once you do get a level of comfort as to what it does, how it can react, what it's going to do, you're going to find that this is a very, very useful tool in your in your arsenal. Exactly. Um, and I think we've just got a couple of statistics. I just mentioned I was going to talk about this later. So from our last uh, and our most current DDoS uh, threat report, which we put out there, we do track the number of weapons. And you know, I've got two statistics with this one, which talks about that we track approximately 15.4 million potential weapons and weapons. And, and this is made up of two different numbers. Around 15 million of these are open um, UDP. Uh, servers typically which can be used in reflection and then amplification attacks and if we go to the next slide the uh, around 400,000 uh, we track is uh, botnet or botnet agents on there and this number can be dramatically different uh, depending on what we see from our honeypots and our systems around the world so one one time we saw this up at around 800,000 um, because there was a, a certain network in uh, India which was uh, we believe was heavily infected by one particular botnet. And then that number drastically came down within two months or so um, when they dealt with that particular issue on their network. 
So, you know, we see there's a lot of potential weapons out there. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, if we go down, I'll actually say, show you how this could this actually could affect organizations, because one of the examples we saw last year on the, you know, the first day of the or our research team saw on the first day of the um, uh, the Russian and Ukraine, Ukraine conflict was some uh, basically DDoS attacks, which were occurring on the same day, the physical Con uh, conflict started, and when we looked at them, yeah, this was the uh, the marketing uh, version of the slide. But if we go to the next slide, you can see that's actually the raw data slide. So this one's very subtle, right? Um, but it's a heat map from the back end system, and you can see there's if you look really carefully, you can see there's actually some purple one in other places like Kiev and uh, you know uh, uh, I can't say it properly, but you know uh, in the um, to the country as well. But you can see there's a massive attack on that central piece. And if you go to the next slide, this is actually some of the data we saw behind it. So, you know, that heat blob, basically, um, we saw 2 million requests hitting a subnet um, in, in uh, the um, uh, in one of the main regions which was being attacked. Uh, and then we saw a second uh, one hit a particular a specific website, which when you looked it up was the cabinet of the ministers of Ukraine, which served the uh, Ukrainian president. And you can see the second one at 600,000 was NTP, which is typically what you would see with a reflection and amplification attack, a very well-known protocol, right? Yep. Like DNS and whatever. Uh, but the, what was interesting was the top one. Because you see ARD, and this was Apple Remote Desktop, sometimes called ARM, Apple Remote Management, but it was a UDP, UDP service. And what was interesting is they were U, the honeypots that we saw this on, which were requesting us to attack these IPs, uh, were in the U.S. So these were actually being, um, you, you know, P, networks in the U.S. were being asked to uh, attack and be part of this uh, cyber conflict, as it were. And it's, it's kind of a trend we've seen where there's, you know, that's just an example of a real world um, incident. But we also see these obscure protocols, you know, the non well known ports and things of that nature, like, you know, CLDAP, you know, and, uh, you know, the Memcache D, where it was requesting information and doing a reflection attack, which was part of the GitHub attack, be some of the largest attacks out there. Because I think the um, uh, UDP services, which people aren't thinking about, or, you know, I mean, with CLDAP, do you really need to enable that? Why is that enabled on your network unless no there's a reason? Right? Yep. I, I mean, so, um, so I think it's a good example. Again, this, you could apply the zero trust principles, and uh, um, you know, by being aware of what's going on in your network can really help. I think. Yeah, I I completely agree. And you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about AI only because, again, it, everybody's talking about it, and it's not new. It's you know, A10, other security companies have been using you know AI related solutions, ML related solutions for a long time. Um, but as you just demonstrated, it, the, the bad guys are using AI too, and they will be the the innovators. They are going to figure out ways to parse large quantities of data, send large amounts of attacks in ways that people can't possibly do. And as we discussed and, and discussed a number of times, eventually you're going to see that AI will fight AI. Um, quite bluntly, it's really the only way that you're going to defeat it because um, I don't know of a single organization that has the resources to combat on an individual basis, all of the potential bots that are out there that a a nefarious gang can throw at them. It's just not possible. There's just there's just too much resources out there. So you need to phone a friend. You need to be able to find help. And, and it's okay to use that help. And that's kind of the whole purpose. Um, so I, I mean, I, wanna, I, I don't want to take and, and drill nothing but AI, but I think it's important to realize that AI is really, really important in your security environment. And if you're, not, if you're using a security solution that doesn't include an AI component, you need to be really questioning whether that's the security solution for you. Um, I wanted to, to have a couple closing thoughts. Um, you know, I, I know that we're running out of time. What's keeping a CISO up at night? What are the CISOs sharing about on the nine o'clock news? We already heard about AI. We already heard about zero trust. One of the things that that is terrifying beyond words is that nobody wants to be told that you are being under attacked or being hacked by a third party or a vendor. Um, that is the CISO's worst nightmare. The, the idea that you have to be told by somebody else that you're under attack and you don't realize it yourself 
is a terrible, terrible thing. So I promise you that there are CISOs right this very moment that are getting ready to go to bed or in bed, and they are worried about this particular issue. Don't be that guy. Figure out a way to not be that person. Uh, you'll sleep better at night, if nothing else. Um, second of all, uh, as we just discussed, how is AI going to impact me? How is it going to impact information security, your organization in general? Are the terminators coming for you? The answer is no, but maybe, right? Um, the, the AI attacks that are out there are real. Uh, chat GPT is a real thing. Um, I don't think that you're going to be you know, AI'd out of a job anytime soon. There's always going to be required that human intervention. And I, I sleep well knowing that, but you should be looking at AI as a tool and, and something to supplement what you're doing, not as a threat to what you're doing as an individual. And then lastly, does the role of the new role of the CISO give me the power and the opportunity to really accelerate change in my organization? And, and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, the SEC finding that just came out about having you know, an executive presence at the, on the board of directors and so on and so forth, I think is critically important. We started this conversation by talking a little bit about why zero trust is important. Is it really just a hype thing? And whether you believe it's a hype thing or not, take it as an opportunity to educate not only your executives, but everybody in your organization about the importance of information security. Um, Go ahead. You, why don't you finish up with this, Paul? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I won't do a product page. I'll just uh, just uh, mention our solution. So obviously, we talked about uh, the application to a controller and load balancing solutions. We have over seven thousand customers, um, so we have a lot of experience in this area. But we also have DDoS protection solutions and um, also the next generation firewall. So if you're interested, please visit us at www.a10networks.com. Yeah, and we're running out of time. So back to you, Chris. Absolutely. So um, obviously, A10 is somebody that I've supported for a long time, even as a practitioner, so on and so forth. They are an interesting company. Um, I, I really do challenge you to take a look. I, I would say this whether Paul was on the call or not. I would challenge you to take a look at some of the things they're doing. It's very innovative. Um, these awards speak for themselves. And don't take my word for it. Look at these as well, right? Um, with that, I know that we wanted to save a little bit of time for um, some questions. Raleigh, I'll hand it off to you. Um, to see what questions we have in the queue. Thank you, Chris and Paul, for those great insights. Paul, someone had a question um, during one of your slides, and it was, can you define ADC and Fastly? I'm not familiar with A10. Okay, yeah. So with that, um, like I said earlier, in around the 2000s, just before, actually it was just before because I was using one in 99, but uh, load balancers came out, which was basically just delivering uh, the connections to multiple different servers before. But obviously, as this was the ingress point to those applications, different uh, optimization and security technology got layered on the load balancers. And they became renamed as application delivery controllers, but probably half the people still call them load balancers. So that's the what an ADC is. It's really basically an advanced load balancer. And then with Fastly, that's a company who provides web application firewall um, technology. And we integrate that into our application delivery controller as the A10 next generation firewall powered by Fastly. Very cool. Thank you for that explanation. The next question I'm going to throw out for both of you, it is what are some of the best practices we can implement to defend against DDoS attacks? Wow. Uh, I'll start at the broadest point and then kind of hand it off to Paul. He's he's really more of an, a, an inline expert on this, but finding a web application firewall solution, a next-gen WAF that, that really does address zero-day attacks and zero-day DDoS attacks, I think is critical. Um, there, there's a lot of them out there. Again, I, I'm not meaning this to be an A10 commercial. I'm sure A10 would like this to be an A10 commercial. They certainly have a best of breed solution to defeat a to defeat your DDoS attacks. Um, but finding that kind of solution, I think is critical. Paul, kind of, can you shed some light on that? Yeah, and, and I think with DDoS, you've got to look at you know what applications you have which are being made available, what assets you're protecting. So you know, the first thing is probably to get informed, read up, read up on some threat intelligence, some threat reports from both A10 and you know there's some really good ones from Microsoft and AWS, like I mentioned earlier. But then like on the application delivery controller, that has has DDoS protection functionality on it, or you can buy network wide. 
DDoS protection solutions if you have a large data center. However, if you're a small enterprise and you're, you know, you basically, the issue is your pipe, uh, i.e. you can't handle that much traffic coming in, maybe you want to look at a cloud scrubbing service. So really, you just got to assess your environment and work out, you know, the threats which might target you. And then also, what's the, the, what DDoS vector do you need to block first or at least prioritize? And uh, what else you could do to protect your network in that arena? Yeah, great answer. Thank you both for those insights. Let's take one final question. Paul, we'll wrap up with you. I want to understand how threat solutions will integrate in my existing environment. Can you explain A10's integration approach? Yeah, so uh, again, we're looking at like um, the potential issues which you might have and how can we mitigate them for you, right? So, um, you know, a web application firewall can help protect your uh, application workloads, i.e. the application itself at the application layer. DDoS can help with some application layer attacks, but it can also help with network level attacks. Like, so it can defend both your infrastructure, because we have some customers, you know, who don't even use our main DDoS protection solutions, but they use, for example, our IPv4 um, uh, technology, which uh, allows you to basically expand the number of IP, IPv4 addresses you have with CGNAT, and they defend those NAT pools with specific technology just to defend that. So really, um, you know, we can help defend in multiple different areas. It really depends on, you know, what, you know, how you might, you are or might be being attacked, and also that biggest um, type of vulnerability you need to defend against. You know, what's most important to you based on your, your type of business. Thank you for that explanation. And thank you again, Chris and Paul, for all that great information. I also wanted to thank the audience for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. As I mentioned, you will be receiving a follow-up email from EMA with additional resources from today's event. So I hope you will check that email out. And I hope we'll see you at a future EMA research webinar. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.